this might be another horrible hot take thing to talk about. So this article has gone somewhat viral within the comedy fan subreddit type of scene, right? The GRE extended universe scene. Everyone's talking about this article from Hollywood Reporter because a lot of people are surmising that this article that's headlined comedian Bobby Lee sues Wondery over cancelled Tiger Belly podcast contract. Everybody's coming to the conclusion that this article is an indication that the LA comedy podcast bubble is about to pop. And this is like the great recession in LA podcast comedy scene type of things. And I'm going to throw out there my uninformed hot take, not having not read the article in full yet. I want to read it with you guys. My uninformed hot take is this is an indication that the bubble is about to burst when it comes to comedic podcasts and shit. This is more of an indication that the, what do you call it? The platform Wonderly or Wondery, and I think Amazon bought it, that they basically overhedge. They basically pay too much for podcast and they're not bringing back enough. But it's not an indication of the overall kind of lay of the land. I think maybe overall content creators are maybe seeing a dip in terms of their contract because there's just not enough money in the in you know in in the economy at the moment to fulfill people's desires and whatnot to kind of get the real big bucks that maybe Joe Rogan was getting. But I don't think this issue that Tiger Belly is going through and Bobby Lee is an indication that the LA podcasting scene is a bubble is about to burst. I don't think so. I think it's more specific case about Wondery betting way too big on pods, you know, paying way over the odds for some that don't deserve the money, have inflated figures, are buying views and bots and stuff. Because that's something I've realised also, having done a lot of content now and been on YouTube for a while and doing this kind of on a semi-serious basis for a long time now, I've realized and I've seen from other things because I, I thought at first it was a weird cope for people that weren't getting views and a weird cope for fans who felt like their favorite pod wasn't getting views via something else. But I also think there's some truth to what people are saying. There's a big community of people who make content who buy views. It's like a thing that happens a lot and a thing that happens a lot often and I think it's a thing that people don't really want to admit and speak about uh, openly, but it's something people do on a daily basis with their content. And the funny thing about it, having checked some of these sites that you can buy packages for, for views and likes, it's not cheap. Like if you want to actually buy views that will make a, a change to your business in terms of allowing you to get bigger contracts for sponsors, allowing you to maybe look like you're actually doing sick numbers, right? You have to pay like quite a bit, like for 50,000 views plus and stuff. You're paying in the grands. It's not cheap. So I was surprised. At first I was thinking, wow, these guys are really spending a lot of money. But then I think about it wrong because I'd imagine spending 50, spending, let's say spending a thousand pounds for one video to get 50,000 views is a good decision to make if you only care about signing contracts to get sponsors for your pod because you, those fake metrics are going to allow you to get a contract of like 50 grand over three years or 50 grand per year for a free year contract. And then you can basically keep inflating the numbers every three years to keep that contract running over, which a lot of people are doing. I think people have accused Brendan Schub of doing that. I think, no, I'm sorry. That's what BGL alleged is going on. I think somebody asked BGL, I think in the AMA, um, about Brendan Schub and about, oh, how is he able to keep everything afloat? The views are shit. We know we don't know no one watches the show. The show is terrible. How is it happening, innit? And he said something like, Oh, he's definitely buying views. And the thing I think he said, BGO, was that most podcast sponsorship are like run there's like a lapse in the length, I think. I think it's the or so, I think he said something along the lines of like most podcast sponsorship you sign are signed like three years, like hence. They're not signed like a year. So you kind of sign something based on the metrics that you're doing now. But then in three years' time, if you dip you're still kind of, you know, you can still kind of double dip and kind of inflate your numbers so that it kind of looks good, but you're always kind of running on a bit of a delay. So the deals that you've got now aren't necessarily um, conducive to you how successful you are in a right now. It's basically based on numbers from like three years ago and whatnot. Anyways, getting into the article. It says, yeah, comedian uh, Bobby Lee is suing Wondery for a breach of contract after the audio company allegedly cancelled a multi-year ad sales and distribution deal for the podcast Tiger Belly and he co-hosts with Kalila Kuhn. That must be a lot of money though, isn't it? To be fair. 
that's probably a lot of money. If they promise to, you know, sign up with Wondery, have them on their platform, maybe do some exclusive content and do ad sales and whatnot and reason whatnot, maybe it was an exclusive deal similar to what Rogan did with Spotify, that's a lot of money that they kind of are entitled to. And if that's in writing, it seems odd that this happened because you'd imagine if, that, if they had a contract and it was broken by the, you know, the platform, they have a basis to kind of get that money back and and maybe more in damages. So it's strange that they would even do this in the first place. Just pay them, innit? Even if it's going to make you bankrupt, just you'd rather pay that than having to pay considerably more down the line when it goes to court. But hey, what do I know? The complaint filed in Los Angeles on Tuesday, on Thursday, sorry, on behalf of Lee's Tiger Belly company alleges that Wondery was under pressure to cut expenses and roll back its financial commitments in anticipation of the podcast market slowdown in 2023, leading the company to terminate its 39-month deal with Tiger Belly Podcast in early April. So everybody is assuming there is going to be a podcast slowdown. Interestingly enough, somebody that's been speaking about this a lot has been uh, Tim Dillon. Tim Dillon was the first person to, I remember say it in this heyday, like surely it has to come to an end. Maybe it's his like nihilism and his, you know, woe is me, black pill type of side of things in his kind of temperament. But he was somebody that was saying at the peak of everything that was going on, him on Rogan, him on the fire and the kid, Chris Delia and he's pumped, you know, Fear Von doing his shit. Like when everyone was at, was red hot. I remember Tim Dillon saying quite early on surely this is going to end this ain't going to last forever like this is people are making money hand over fist it's going to come to an end at some point I don't think again like this is conduct conducive to the whole scene I think it's specific and wondery thing but taking those things into account I could be incorrect it continues the deal which Tiger Belly and Wondery reached in December 2022 was in exchange for a multi- multi-million dollar financial guarantees that reflected the widespread success and popularity of the podcast so they're missing out on millions i wish we could find out the deal or what they signed it for tiger belly wandery deal announced let's see uh let's see tiger belly dropped by amazon of a Oh, okay. Ah, oh, look at this subreddit post headline. I'm not going to click it, but look at the headline. Tiger Belly dropped by Amazon over Tijuana story backlash. So maybe that's why they got dropped. Obviously, you know, they're going to use the, they're going to use the fucking cover that it's the financial system and economy at the moment. Maybe, maybe because they can't really, this is not really a breach of contract. Maybe, but that might be the real reason why Tiger Belly got dropped from Amazon because of that Tijuana story going viral again a couple of months back. Maybe that's a point. I don't have the numbers for it, but I wonder how much um deal worth. Was it like 10 million, 5 million? I'm not too sure. It doesn't say. Amazon buys Wondery. Okay, cool. Jesus Christ. Amazon valued Wondery at 300 million only a couple of years ago. That's insane. Let's click this was from The Verge about Wondery when Amazon bought it, okay? So this this maybe does mean the, the podcast bubble is bursting because it's only three years ago. And look how much has changed so far. Amazon buys Wondery, this is from three years ago, courtesy of The Verge. Amazon buys Wondery, setting itself up to compete with Spotify for podcast domination. So this means Amazon has basically given up on podcasts, essentially. Um, you'd imagine, with them kind of uh, winding things down with Wondery. So it says here, one, at Wondery, one of the last major independent podcast networks might soon be owned by Amazon. The company's announced an acquisition deal today, ending speculation about who might eventually buy the network, which is most well known for its true crime podcast, Dirty John. Amazon didn't disclose the acquisition prices, but although early reports from Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal suggest Wondery's value is at 300 million. Wondery would technically be part of Amazon Music, which launched podcast support in September. Wondery CEO Hernan Lopez will step down and leave the company when the deal closes and CEO Jane Sargent will take over, according to Wall Street. In my opinion, I don't even know why Amazon even bought Wondery. Unless they have a really popular, maybe that those true crime podcasts do crazy numbers, so it's unavoidable. But if you're Amazon, surely just building up building out your own podcast division from scratch 
is a far better way to do it than signing a massive network that's already established and paying way over the odds for their talent, especially when you imagine the entire network of podcasts on Wondery, maybe only one or two of them actually make them money. The rest of them are just kind of enjoying the glow of the one or two that actually pull numbers. So you're overpaying for just two podcasts on there that you actually like and the rest of them are fucking shit. So I don't get why they didn't just like build their own podcast division themselves from scratch and start small. That would have set them up way better than actually trying to buy, overpay for something that already exists. I don't know. Again, I'm not a numbers guy. Let's go back to the article. In the termination notice sent to Tiger Belly, Wondery also alleged... Um, also allegedly cited moral clause and pointed to a 2013 story that Leeds hold and later said was made up for shock value. Oh, this explains so much. No wonder Bobby Lee was going around saying that all these stories are fake, basically taking everything back about his weird upbringing, about his weird sexual exploration in his youth and how he always felt less than and he had to go and hire hookers in Tijuana and Thailand allegedly to go and lose his virginity and all this sort of shit and all the other freak shit he's done in his life. He was taking so much of the stories that made Bobby Lee who he is and what made people fans of his podcast. It made people, even though I'm, I'm like a casual Tiger Belly fan, but I remember seeing on the sub, loads of fans like disappointed, like raw. I kind of, was a fan of Bobby Lee and kind of loved him because he was, he lived such a crazy, debaucherous, um, you know, gluttonous, you know, hedonistic life when he was younger. Now he's sober, but that's what kind of drew me into the guy, that he's such a fuck up. And now I'm learning all those stories that brought me so much joy because I maybe resonate with them or it's something that I can just relate to or whatever it may be. They're all fake. It kind of threw people for a loop, but now it makes sense because literal millions was on the line millions of dollars was on the line so i don't blame him for taking it all back and saying it was all a prank it's a prank it's a prank bro it didn't happen it's a prank because millions was on the line fuck anyway um about paying for a young looking sex worker who had tears in their eyes in tijuana while a guest on other podcasts a compliance said um Prior to the one termination of the contract, Lee is also subject to a public pushback after clips of the comedian telling the Tijuana story began resurfacing online in late March, leading Lee to address the story again in April. Um, in the episode, Lee said he felt terrible and explained that he made up the story by combining two bits that he had used on a tour about going on a date with a girl who looked like she was 12. <laughs> uh, explaining that Tijuana joke away. And making it make sense by saying the girl you dated looked like a 12-year-old <laughs> is not the best way to defend yourself. I don't think so. Anyway, a 12-year-old Natalie Portman for the movie Leon, the professional. Another about speeding up um, having sex with a girlfriend who started crying about her deceased grandmother. Now, me, to be fair, if I'm going to be... And again, I want to be the fucking... What's that word called? Contrarian guy of the year. But I have a... But I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about this type of shit. Don't sign controversial, edgy people who get loads of views online and then get surprised about their controversial and edgy past. Maybe this is something in, in the current times to break your trust. Fair enough. Or whatever that goes against what you stand for. Cool. But if you sign controversial, edgy guy or girl... And then suddenly clips come out of them being controversial and edgy. You're not allowed to terminate the contracts. I think that's super out of order. You sign them off the basis that they go viral for saying the things that people don't usually say. For saying edgy stuff and pushing the line and whatever it may be. Then keep your word. Do you know what I mean? Like sign them and hold them down for that regard. But then deciding to suddenly be the moral police and it's all wrong and naughty is crazy because that Tijuana story has been around for time. Like, Wondery and Amazon didn't do their due diligence. They didn't do their background checks. Which I don't think a lot of these companies do. One thing I realized with covering these comedians and people in the entertainment industry, I found out from Joey Diaz specifically, no one watches tape. Jerry Diaz has mentioned on, on many podcasts on Church of What's Happening originally. He's mentioned it now when he's got his podcast to, commit, to promote his book. But Jerry Diaz always said when he was stand, starting out in Hollywood doing auditions and people would ask him for tape and, you know, 
basically, you know, all stuff that he's done already on tape, compilations of, of his skits and whatnot and whatnot, acting real, <laughs> scissor real, whatever you call it. He would send them sometimes blank DVDs and they would ring back and say, hey, I checked out your tape. You're fucking amazing and book him for a show. And he knows he didn't say anything. He, did, he didn't send anything. The, the CD was blank. So they were booking him based off his clout or him being friends with Rogan or because he was a good fit. But they'd always lie and say they watched the tape but they didn't. So people don't watch tapes, clearly. And another thing I learned in the entertainment industry, nobody does actual background checks. So they sign these popular podcast people, these popular content creators, these popular influencers, public figures, and they do no background checks, no even a slight Google during the meeting to just see what people say about this person, their name, Reddit, their name in Twitter, their name on Google, news, look through the articles, zero. They just kind of like always get caught off guard. Oh, surprise, surprise. I fucking hate that shit, personally. Anyway, Tiger Bay's complaint alleges that the company never agreed to a moral clause in its contract with Wondery. <laughs> ah, Bobby Lee is scrambling. He's like, look, you didn't say it would be an issue if I fuck 12-year-olds in Tijuana. So technically, now that it's come up, you can't be mad. <laughs> you can't be mad. It's like, you know, promise. it's like saying to a girlfriend or boyfriend, promise you won't be mad. Okay, cool. First, I cheated. Okay, cool. I'm sorry. And it was with a 12-year-old. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was in Tijuana. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, this scrambling, mate. Fucking hell. And noted that Wondery would have known about the Tijuana story prior to striking a deal. The Tiger Belly episode was also released before the beef actor and David Cho apologized and claimed that he had made up the story about raping the massage therapist during his 2014 episode of the podcast. So everybody now is making up stories. Everybody now um, is just joking. Everything was a joke. Everything was a made up story. Everything was an elaborate plot to be famous. Nothing was real. You can't believe any of these comedians, man. Fuck, man. My fucking childhood has been ruined. A representative from Wondery did not immediately have comment when reached by the Hollywood Reporter. Tiger Belly is seeking a jury trial and damages in the millions of dollars, according to the complaint. Lee, who has a recurring role in Magnum P.I. and Sex and the City reboots, recreated Tiger Belly podcast with Kuhn in 2015 and uploaded weekly episodes on YouTube and on major podcast platforms. I love how Kalila is like always in this fucking bits, isn't it? That guy, what's his name? Comedy enforcement guy. He's going to be so pissed reading this article because Kalila's name is like featured in here all the time. Like how many times have they mentioned Kalila? Let's see Kuhn. But she's like a, she's like an integral part of the pod. Yeah, she's got two mentions on there. Co-host with Kalila Kuhn. Podcast with Kalila Kuhn. Like that comedy enforcement guy is going to be, I hate women. <laughs> He's going to be so angry. Anyway, <laughs> I this sexy Filipino bitch. I hate her. <laughs> exactly. It was so mad. Anyways, this uploading weekly episodes. The show has ranked among the top 50 podcasts in comedy category on Apple Podcasts, according to Chartable. Um, and the recent guests have included Megan Trainer. Blah, blah, blah. So, what's my final takeaway from this? My final takeaway from this is double, is kind of a bit long. So, number one, comedians for a long time had this thing that they would always say, like they were cowboys of the entertainment industry that they were kind of like maybe like a quasi peter pan independent soldier type of person never going to stand up to the man against the establishment anti-council culture but really and truly they all really want to be part of the industry when a deal comes across their table very rarely have you seen a comedian reject it they all sign up to them deals and most of those deals and those platform signups, network signups, are usually a a a kind of um, all inclusive thing where they're usually tied in with ads. So your podcast, you sign up to a network or to whatever it may be. They kind of or an agency, they take it under the umbrella, and they're the ones that get the ads and the sponsors for you. So all you have to do is especially is, is specifically is sit in front of the camera like I do, press record and go, and they handle all the actual money that you generate from your pod maybe outside of merch you do it yourself but anything to do with ads and promo and stuff they handle it so that's why these guys and girls love signing up to networks but they'll like, like you to believe that they're anti cancel culture they don't want to be controlled by the man they do their own thing and actually the weird thing for me as being a fan of comedy is that 
if you actually want to be a comedian and you want to push the envelope, you want to push up right against the line, you want to be edgy, you want to say what the fuck you want to say, this platform is actually the best. Because even if you get booed off of a place like YouTube and they tell you you're breaking TOS, you can go onto many other video sharing platforms, streaming platforms, kicks, the rumbles, the twitches, even they kick you off of there. If that doesn't work, you can go behind a paywall on Patreon. There's so many platforms you can go and be kind of uh, have no filter and just say what you want, but they don't want to do that, really. They really don't want to do that. They kind of want to play within the kind of margins. They want to play within the scene, but also be looked at as some sort of like, you know, cancel culture soldier, like anti-work, whatever it may be. But really, they're playing the same game. That's the funny thing about it. They all get signed up to deals. Like, I, don't, I can't think of many podcasts within the LA comedy, the Jerry Extended Universe type of scene that are independent. I can't think of many. And the funny thing about it, I would imagine, again, I don't know much, but I would imagine you could actually make more money being independent than signing up to an agency or a network and shit. You can actually make more. It obviously require more work because you have to fill the inquiries yourself. You have to maybe source them. You maybe have to do a lot of outbound calls, emails, shit, whatever it may be. But if you actually was in it to make money and you actually was in it to have a platform where you could be unfiltered and say what you want and untethered and, you know, not have anybody over you, overbearing, telling what you can and cannot say, you would do it on your own. You would actually bet on yourself, as Jesse L is saying now in the chat. You would actually bet on yourself, but they don't. They don't bet on themselves. They bet on themselves because they're talking by themselves in front of a camera, but everything else is handled by somebody. Someone does the merch. Someone does the ads. Someone does the sponsors. Someone does the website. Someone updates the fucking list. Like, all of that shit's been handled by somebody else, somebody else, but they act like they're like... And also, the fact about it is all that's annoying. They act like they're doing a lot of hard work. They're working hard. No, you're not. Your producer does everything for you. He does the thumbnails, does all the artwork does all the the titles descriptions the timestamps. all you do is sit in front of a camera and basically fuck around and some of them can't even do that they start talking to you about fucking covid and start giving you fucking life lessons that's the funny shit about it but i also think it's fucking hilarious that one of bobby lee's kind of stories that made him famous and made him kind of a, a household name and kind of endeared him to a whole group of fans is also the one story that is potentially going to cost him the most amount of money he would have ever received in his ever in the history of his career because there's no denying a lot of these guys if podcasting didn't exist they would never be as famous as they are now like the podcast boom effectively changed all these guys lives so it's no surprise that they are fighting tooth and nail tooth and fucking nail to hold on to what they have and to also fight for what they think they deserve because they know this is never going to come back around again. They're never going to have a chance to make multi-million dollar deals based off of the dumb things they say in front of a microphone because sooner rather than later, people are going to not care anymore and it's not going to be cool or cute anymore to hear like Bobby Lee, if I'm not mistaken, is like 57, approaching 60. He's not going to be cute anymore. People are going to see him for his age soon. And all those stories and him being awkward, him being shy, him being like a big kid, it's going to look a bit lame. And fans are going to get put off by it and eventually go their separate ways. So clearly, they have to, have to try and get what they need from this deal because it's not going to come back around again. But again, all these comedians are full of absolute shit in terms of being independent, going against the man, being by themselves, not signing deals, being independent. They all want to be a part of Hollywood. They all want to be a, on Netflix. They want to be on a big network. They all want to sell out desperately. But most of them don't have anything worth selling out for, really, it looks like. Um, and businesses are legitimately thinking, hey, we paid way over the odds for you. Because if they're valued at 300 million, you would imagine, considering what other podcasts were getting at the time, I would be led to believe that Bobby Lee's Tiger Belly was possibly signed to that network for the region of i'm gonna say 10 to 20 mil easy they probably signed tiger belly to wondery for 10 to 20 million and in my opinion i think tiger belly podcast by itself is overpriced for 10 to 20 million if you include tiger belly 
and um, what's it called? Bad Friends? Fair enough. But I don't think Andrew Santino seems like a smart guy. I don't think he would allow that deal to go through like that. Um, but if they would have included, you know, Tiger Belly Productions includes Tiger Belly Pod and fucking Bad Friends, fair enough. But just Tiger Belly for 10 to 20 mil? For like a contract, you know, just for to basically distribute the show or to just have it under their network or whatnot or exclusivity for a short amount of time? Nah, it's not worth it. It's not worth it in the slightest. It's not worth it in the slightest, especially when you consider the whole magic of Tiger Belly was that, you know, Kalila and Bobby Lee were like in a couple. They, they, were, they were together, right? Now that they're not together anymore and then this weird kind of working relationship thing, that's awkward. That doesn't work. Um, clearly they've had a lot of history things have gone on behind the scenes that have affected the kind of chemistry of the show so it's not as fun as it was before maybe the fact that Bobby Lee's becoming a legit you know kind of actor in his own regard isn't helping Kalila maybe getting famous in her own regard isn't helping but the show isn't as good as it once was it's probably never going to reach the heady heights of what it was three four years ago so paying 10 to 20 million for it now is definitely a bit much. Even if it was in 2020 when it, when it got signed or 2021, that's a bit much personally for me. So I'm not surprised that they're kind of trying to double back on it. But I also don't like the fact that they signed them knowing that they were edgy and then got surprised when the edgy pass came and bit them in the ass. I don't like that personally. But anyway, let's move on from 